The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Thank you, Father, for this word that you have for us today. We just, we just ask, Lord, that, that our hearts would be open to you and, and your teaching and your instruction and, and your word. Father, we just, we just want to bless your name. We just want to bless you in this service today. Amen. I started out the week. Well, it's been a, it's been a really rough couple of weeks. We, my wife and I are on a on a diet, it's, it's no, no grains, no sugar, no dairy, and you're looking at somebody that's at least half Italian, even if I don't look it. You know, we, we live on grains, dairy, and wheat. I mean, what's lasagna? So I'm dying. I feel like I'm dying the first couple of weeks, but um, it's been really good, and I've been, I've been really giving it to the Lord as a time of fasting, plus it's getting my body healthier um, in the process. Um, and during this time has been revealing some things that sh- maybe should have been rudimentary or, or, or something that I felt like I should have learned this type of thing in the beginning of my walk with the Lord, but um, became revelation to me even though I, I already did know it intellectually. Um, let, me, let me read through some a scripture that the Lord gave me at the beginning of, of my studies. Um, it's funny. It's funny because you know how it keeps coming up. A commercial back in the day, uh, I don't know, several, a couple decades ago maybe, uh, about the Tootsie Roll commercial. Everything I think I see belo- becomes a Tootsie Roll to me. <laughs> because when you're on this diet and you don't have any sugar, it's like y'all look like Heath bars. <laughs> you look so good. It, it might it might uh, interrupt my preaching. Because I, I really want that chocolate-covered toffee. Oh, Lord. The other day, I, I cut up. We're allowed to have a small amount of fruit, so I cut up one half of a strawberry. <laughs> a half a strawberry. I cut it up. I, I was enjoying it. I mean, you don't, you don't understand how much you enjoy. Uh, and, I, and I slice it up, and I put it on top of my sweet potato with a little bit of almond butter, because we're allowed to have almond butter. And I, and I closed my eyes, and I, and I, and I imagined myself eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> it was so good. It was so good. Now, now I, I think my, my mother-in-law actually came into town this, this past week, and we were spending some time with her, and she had mentioned that she saw that Harvard, Harvard Medical had a, a study out that said that, the, that larger, larger thighed women live longer than than thin. And I thought, that was really interesting. That's a really interesting study. It's Harvard Medical. But I said, you know what, though? I said, it doesn't take Harvard Medical to tell me that the, the, the little, bit, little bit of weight on, on the woman, you live a lo- little bit longer than the guys that actually mention it. Right? <laughs> anyway, I'm not up here to do comedy. I'm just wanna, I want to read you the scripture. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I wouldn't live very long if I said anything. In my, in my pursuit of him during this time of fasting and, and dieting on my part, he gave me the scripture, Psalm 139, and it's, it's pretty well known, and it's one of my dad's favorite scriptures that he refers back to a lot, um, because it's, it's pretty much all about acceptance and how, how the Lord uh, sees us and knew us before we were born. Let me, let me go, go ahead and read that for you. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. God's perfect knowledge of man. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not one word that is on my tongue 
But behold, O Lord, you knew it all together. You have hedged behind me and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high and I can't attain it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in, in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, yet unformed. And here's why God, high above, sees far below. No matter the distance, he knows everything about us. In your book, they are all written, the days fashioned for me. When I was yet there, there was none of them. How precious also your thoughts towards me, O God, how great the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Let's skip down to verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties or my anxious thoughts. And see if there are any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Now what I thought really was profound, like all of this, this, whole, this whole thing. If, if, you have a, if you have daddy issues, this is, this is going to ruffle your feathers a little bit. But this is uh, God the Father and how he knows us. And, and, and even before we were formed and shapeless in our, in our mother's womb, he knew, he knew us. And, and see, where that, I heard somebody say off the cuff, I don't remember if it was a TV show or something, where it says that he, he said, um, the actor said, that the, once the baby's six months in the womb, they start dreaming. I don't know what age, what age you know, in the womb that they actually start dreaming, but that's what was said on this show, whatever I was watching. And, I, and he said, and that means he's a real person. Six months in the womb. And I was like, then, you know, that's, you get late-term abortions and things like that come up. And if people really think that, that you're not human until you start dreaming at six months, that's sick, in my opinion. I'm sorry. But he knew us before we were even formed. That's when we became life. He created us. Anyway, I'm not going to stay there for very long, but... What's so amazing about that scripture is the fact that the whole scripture up until the last couple of verses is how God knows us intimately and his desire is for to know us intimately like that. But yet at the, in the last two scriptures, it's our, his, David's response, the psalmist's response was search me. So after he built, he already understands the relationship, the love relationship that God has towards him. He's like, do surgery on me. I trust you because you have my heart. You know everything about me better than I know myself. Search me for anything that's hidden even from myself. I think it's just awesome because of that relationship's being built in the beginning. He understands that. So then he's like, I trust you enough to, to you pick the cherries. What do I need to deal with? I love it. But but my my goal in 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 any fast is to pursue God, to get to know Him. And He kind of turned the tables on me. The message for today is going to be the pursuit of God. 
Did you know that this completely omniscient, self-sufficient, awesome God, that he has everything that he needs, and he does he, he, he has everything. But he seeks after something. He's, he's seeking after us. And what's, 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 it blew my mind. I mean, it, it's, it's very simple. He seeks us. And there's plenty of scriptures that the Bible is, you know, can convey that. Um, in Luke 19.10, we find that Jesus tells us that he's come to seek and save the lost. In a lot of translations, it says he's come to, to seek that which was lost. And my interpretation of that which was lost was relationship with us. From the beginning of time, Adam, even the creation of man, he was created for relationship. He was created to have face-to-face in the garden walk with the Lord because that the Lord, even though he's is awesome and self-sufficient and doesn't need anything and he knows everything. He created us for a relationship. He has a need. We get a glimpse into his heart when we read in, in Luke 15 where he compares himself with the shepherd that leaves the 99 and to go after the one lost. That's not even good business practice for a shepherd, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. I didn't understand these things until I started studying this stuff. And, and until God gave me the re- revelation, I kind of understood. It's showing us that those that are already righteous in, in, in him don't need the attention as much as the one that just left the group. In my, in my reasoning mind, I, fi- I figured that was terrible because, I mean, you leave 99 sheep and they can go all over the place. You know, you might just want to sacrifice the one. But, in fact, he, 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 it's not even that he goes and finds it. He goes and finds it, puts it on his shoulders, takes it back, and rejoices with everybody else that we, we got this one sheep back. And, and I, I, I read it, but I, I was like... Yeah, I understand. He loves me. But I, don't, I didn't understand the pursuit. And then he showed me, you know, because what I understood was, yeah, uh, the, the, the father loves me. I always saw myself as a prodigal because I was in the muck and mire. I never asked my dad for money to, to go squander. But in my life, I went to the, I went to the, the farthest reaches of, away from the Lord that I could find. And I, but I, I return. So I understand the story of the prodigal son to that extent. But I never saw it really as a pursue, the, the father pursuing. I always saw it as the father waiting. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to go and grab the boy out of the muck and mire and, and save him like that. And I thought, well, that's just a different aspect of God. And, I, and then I was rereading it during the study, and I was like, no. Because in, in Luke 15, 20, he says, <clears throat> when, when he came to his senses, the, the prodigal son says, so, I got up, so he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a far, a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And I went, wait a minute. He saw his son coming from afar off. What does that mean? He didn't know how long he was going to be gone. He hoped and waited and must have set apart some time to search the horizon every day, if not continually, every day, waiting. Otherwise, he would have missed it. He wouldn't have seen him from afar off coming. That is pursuit, and that's how God works. The other one that got me was one of the parables in, in, well, two of the parables in Matthew 13. I'll read them to you. 
the first one. And I, now, I, when I read these, I uh, automatically thought that they were the same. I'll read them to you and see what you can, you can see. The parable of the hidden treasure. Verse 40, uh, that's Matthew 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he had and buys that field. So these are parables about the kingdom of the Lord and how valuable they are and how we should search after them and seek them. I said, okay. And then again in the next verse, the parable of the great, uh, the parable of the pearl of great price. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all he had and bought it. So, what I didn't, what, what, what the Lord's revelation on that was for me is the fact that in the first verse, we look, we look at the kingdom of heaven is a treasure. As if it was in a field, we should pay attention to that. We should go after that. We should buy the field, sell everything we have, and go for the kingdom. Go. That's, that's our pursuit. But when I looked at the pearl of great price, the, curl, the pearl of great price is not the treasure. It's not, the, it's, it's not what's related to here. It says the kingdom of heaven is like the merchant seeking. Not the pearl of great price this time. We are the pearl of great price. It's so fundamental, but I didn't get it my whole life. He sold everything because he has, we have intrinsic value that he had placed in us. And he gave it all for us. Oh, it totally blew me away. At the very core of scripture, lays the truth that God is not only seeking, but he's actively pursuing, longing for a deeper, intimate, face-to-face relationship with his creation. And that's us. <laughs> Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all he had and bought it. Right from the beginning... Of creation, God reveals Himself as one who is seeking communion with us. In the Garden of Eden, we find God walking beneath the trees, searching for Adam after he had taken of the apple. God knew where Adam was, but it shows him searching for him. He still searched for him even when he was in the sin. He came searching and calling for Adam. In the first pages of the, uh, of the Bible, God wanted to point out one thing, that right at the root, the entirety of creation and all of history, we find God searching us, pursuing us, drawing us, wooing us. I miss this my whole life. I knew it, but I didn't know it. Job knew when God was pursuing him and longing for communion with him, amidst the most terrible hardships, he was forsaken and doomed, even by his closest friends. When he was in severe pain and despair and about to give up, wondering why God wouldn't break in and save him, he recalled that there was more than his reaching out to God that's involved. It's God reaching out to him. Job's last resort was reminding God of his pursuit of him. I thought that was fascinating too. He cried out, Lord, I know you are seeking communion with me, as he does with all of us. That's his heart. When you let me die, I won't be here to give you any more communion. That's basically what he said. Your reaching out is going to be unanswered. But Job found hope 
in God's pursuit of him and knowing that he did pursue him. He didn't just create us and now we just live on earth and make the best of it. He created us to be pursued by him forever. There's a twist at the end of this message that I'm going to reveal to you later, but for now I'll just let you keep you thinking. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search my sheep and seek them out. Ezekiel thirty-four eleven. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. That's Jesus. I never, I mean, I read these, but I never got it. Like, why is it? What's so special about me? That he would give all. What's so special about somebody, a God that has everything? Who is man that we're, he is mindful of us, right? The cry within Jesus' heart in the Garden of Gethsemane, in one of the hardest, most challenging moments in his entire earth walk, was, Father, I desire them. Do, 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 does any of you know that God desires us? He desires us. Wherever we're at, He desires relationship with us. It's, it's phenomenal if you don't have a good viewpoint of your, your earthly parents, how much you really can judge God for that He does not deserve. God desires us. It takes, it takes humility to even receive the fact that what is there to desire, Lord, if there's something, okay, you know. How is it possible at the core of this completely self-sufficient, eternally happy, and completely satisfied God that we find an all-consuming fire of desire for his creation. How is it possible that God of all creation that is left unimpressed by the enormous amounts of galaxies and stars and the continuation of the expansion of the galaxy as it is, the hugeness, the vastness, that, that we actually can move him. One person can move him. I don't mean physically push. I mean move him emotionally through prayer how is it even possible that his heart's moved by us that he finds pleasure in us this is in Psalm 149 for the Lord takes pleasure in his people and how is it possible that he would choose something so weak so broken so imperfect I know to be the object of his pleasure. No other book in all of history has given a clearer account on the utter depravity of man. Yet it's the same book that tells us that we are the delight of the holiest being of all. We are told that we are dark and yet lovely. We are told that we are sinful and gone astray, yet we are called the, the pearl of great price. This is completely incomprehensible to me in ways. And I'm, I, I'm praying that the Lord reveals this more and deeper because you, are, you guys are all loved and pursued continually forever. That's crazy. It's completely incomprehensible to me that I'm found precious in his eyes. That he's concerned about me. 
that in his all-knowing, he still searches and he's intimately acquainted with all my ways, as in Psalm 139. The more I ponder it, the more unfathomable it seems to become that I am to him the apple of his eye. Some days it's almost absurd to think that. But I receive it. O Lord, what is man that you are mindful of him? I think that as a church, as a whole, we have, we have yet to grasp that intensity of God's pursuit for us and his desire for us. We are that precious pearl and somehow worth enough to sell everything for in order for him to get it. It's worth so much to him that he would give all, even his life, to obtain it so precious that the everlasting would embark on such a vehement pursuit of our hearts. Amen? And as if that wasn't enough, Jesus has in scriptures presented himself as the bridegroom. A loving, wooing, and jealous bridegroom. He compares us to a cherished bride, though blemished, maybe without, I mean, unblemished, without spot or wrinkle. But he does it throughout scripture. He doesn't only pursue us, he pursues us as a bridegroom pursues his bride. That has completely captivated his heart. He does not only desire us, but he desires us as passionately as a a bridegroom and a bride. And I think he compared himself to that particular picture for us because there's no other better picture to express the deep and passionate longing he has for us. Uh, I wouldn't know of any other As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you, Isaiah 62, 5. That means he is actively reaching out for us. He is pulling the strings of our hearts to win us over. And he does things around us to get our attention so that we could respond back. So that we could respond back in love with, to him. You know, and, I, and I, look, I look at some of my notes and I'm thinking, you know, How many things has the Lord protected you from? Near-death experiences, car accidents. How many things did God, through His grace, deliver you out of? These are all things of, these are signs of Him pursuing us to try and woo us back. You know, I have a certain relative that that, that certain things happen over and over and over that, that look horrible, but they always make it. You know, like, you know, I don't know, half a dozen car accidents in a few years and train wrecks and airplanes falling in front of them and, I mean, crazy stuff. Um, and they, they, they're, yet they're always okay. I got run over by a, they got run over by a car twice. Ran over somebody once. They were okay. But, but it's like these things, and, and they constantly live through it, and it's like how much more do you have to have the sign, you know, God, I, 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 want, I need you in relationship with me so I could deal with your stuff. You know, how many more of these things need to happen? What's really neat, though, is, is when we see him as the bridegroom, it's him taking the initiative. And I've never seen that. Well, it, the, the whole time that I've been even under this ministry, it's, it's, it seems like it's the pursuit of, of, getting to, of being with God and developing intimacy with God, our pursuit. But it's a two-way road. We, we need both. And I'm not saying that 
he doesn't, he doesn't, you know, my dad doesn't preach that. I'm saying that there's a, there's a, there's a, a setback there. It's pursuing intimacy with God. That is an incredible set. But I never heard it this way. I never heard how much he pursues us, draws us, even when we're in really bad shape. He's constantly show, making himself and pulling on those cords uh, on our heart. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me my husband and I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. Hosea. There are countless examples in Scripture where we find God reaching out to people, wooing their hearts, making them His. Abraham, Moses, Elijah, the whole nation of Israel. (laughs) Even the disciples, when He says, follow me, and they drop everything and follow him. They were so enticed by his longing for communion with them that they just dropped everything and went. In all these occurrences, he took the initiative. It was God's desire at work drawing the people to him. Then I passed you by and saw you, and behold, you were at the time of love. I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness, so I also, I also swore to you and, and entered into a covenant with you so that you would become mine, declares the Lord. That's Ezekiel 16.8. God has taken it upon himself, the task to draw us into a love relationship with him, to hold us, to cover us, to protect us, to win us over, to win our hearts and make us His forever. He is actively reaching out to us. And one of the beautiful truths of the Bible is that it's always been God reaching out to man. It's not man reaching out to God. Our reaching back is just in response to His pursuit of us. Amen? We love because he first loved us. How many times we say say that scripture and it's like, what? Oh. Following Jesus is actually nothing else than being drawn by him. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. Jeremiah 31, 3. And I, if I'm lifted up uh, uh, above the earth, will draw all men unto myself. That's John 12, 32. You did not choose me, but I chose you. No one can come to me unless by the Father who sent me draws him. And we love because he first loved us. God draws us because he is jealous of our love. And Really, when you think about it, when you've ever become jealous, it's because of something that you cared about. Sort of like when a husband and wife are together and he would, you know, he doesn't want a shared shared commitment. (laughs) He doesn't want another husband (laughs) involved with with the same wife. It's not right. But it's the same. It's the same jealousy. You, you, don't, you don't share. It's, we should be all his. The parables of Jesus that were mentioned above, well, not only that, but there should be another gods before me because if he's jealous, he's jealous because you went astray and you're idols. Anybody, anything over him is an idol and he gets jealous over that as well. The parables that Jesus mentioned above just don't show that God is seeking, but they also stress the immense effort he puts into into it all. His persistence and readiness to sacrifice extravagantly for what he is looking. In his journey, he is a fierce warrior fighting over our hearts, and he won't stop until they are wholly his. I want you to just picture this as I'm talking. 
because we don't think about it very often. We worship and serve a God that is extravagant towards us in his, in his pursuit of us, in, us in, in, in constant pursuit. It's amazing. And, and, and we sometimes just set it aside and we, we want to just feed our brains, the, you know. But what about, what about his pursuit of us? He fights over us. He's a fierce warrior. He wants, he won't stop until he has it all. We have, we have a song that we sing. I think it's, I can't remember exactly what the name of it is. We find that God is a jealous bridegroom who will go to great lengths to win the love of the one that he desires. In Jesus' earth walk and his crucifixion, we see how relentless God is in his pursuit for the human heart. Jesus willingly died through the hands of his creation to show us how far his love would go. Once and for all, he proclaimed, and he'll stop at nothing, that no effort, no price is too high to win our hearts. In all of history, man has never seen a pursuit more tenacious than this. God is so good. I was so focused on my pursuit of knowing him that I never fully grasped the, the, the whole study of this pursuit just blew my mind. I, it wasn't on my radar, so to speak. When you look at, at Song of Solomon, or Psalms, Song of Psalm, Songs, uh, it's eight, verse six and seven. Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death and jealousy as demanding as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire in the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. That's, that's how he feels about us. It puts in a whole new perspective when you think about, well, God is doing this. And is God doing this to me? Is this why I'm stuck in traffic? Or is this why I lost my job? God is doing this to me to teach me a lesson. Oh. He is in loving pursuit of us, regardless of our circumstances. Like, Powerfully. It's, it says his longing for us is as strong as death. Jealousy is, is more demanding than the grave. That's pretty darn jealous. <laughs> it's not a nice, his desire isn't just a nice little theory or concept. It's a raging torrent, eternal, unquenchable, infernal, within the heart of God, more demanding than the grave. It's hard for me to even get it down into my spirit. It's like, I still feel like, what, what, really? Me? But it's true for all of us. It's his fervent desire and affection for his creation. His pursuing us isn't just a neat idea. It's a fierce, demanding reality. And I want to make that more reality in my life. He's an all-consuming fire, burning with holy jealousy and going to great lengths of love for his creation. When I started this small revelation, when I started praying about this and God was revealing to me and he's showing me Psalm 139 and everything, I, I, it was because during this time that we were dieting, my wife and I, I got this, this great idea that we would have, uh, we would start a, a, our own like journaling with, a, um, with the help of a, a couple books that I found that were, um, there was a, it was a guy's book and a girl's book and it was in pursuit of 
So the husband in pursuit of his wife and the wife in pursuit of the husband. So we each get our own journal separate. And we go through daily 31 days of pursuing each other. And I was like, okay, this, looks, this is great because we'll start on Valentine's Day, be all, you know, lovey and, and all that stuff. Because it's hard. Once you have kids, it's... We never, okay, put it this way. We, we, we got married and we, got, we met and talked for a couple weeks and got married three weeks later. So we didn't have any dating time. We didn't get to know each other in that romantic settings and, and things like that. So these things, and then when, when you have kids right away, and we had kids, I knew my, my wife pregnant more than not pregnant <laughs> is, is so far since we've been married. And so once that happens, it's like you have to fight for your time together. You really do. And it has to be, it has to be on the, in, the, in your mind and in a goal always. Otherwise, you, you miss it. Anyway, but that's why I, did, I started doing this. And I said, well, we could start on Valentine's Day. I gave it to her as a Valentine's Day present. And we, we, didn't, we didn't make it real long. Between the diet and the children and stuff, we were like, we did day one. And we were like, oh. Let's wait till we're done with this crazy diet. We have more energy. Um, but what's really awesome about it is it, it took me off guard because what I found out is that you can't give what you don't have. You can't. You could pretend, and that doesn't work. I, I don't, I, and, I, and I don't ever plan on doing that. That's called willpower. And you can only, you only have so much. Some people have more than others, but... Yeah, it doesn't, that doesn't work. But, but what happened was I was pleasant, pleasantly surprised in the fact that when I was reading the beginning, of the, just day one, and I'm thinking, I got to pursue my wife, I got to pursue my wife, I got to try, try. It was all about God pursuing us. And I'm like, oh, if I don't receive it first, I can't give it. <laughs> this is just day one. <laughs> and I'm like blown out. <laughs> I'm getting revelations and I'm blown out of the water by the first page. And, and part of the study was look up stuff, look up the, the scriptures that, that, that are meaningful to you and how God pursues you. And that's what the message was today. But the challenge for those married folks Especially, I'm going, to go, I'm going to go for the guys first. But if you go back and listen to this message and, and, and teaching, what have you, and you have it in focus of how does Christ love the church? And you say, you know, that's how I'm supposed to treat my wife. That's how I'm supposed to love her. That's a big challenge. But, but God gives us the grace to do it. How does Christ love the church? That's how you're supposed to treat your wife. Was he in continual pursuit of intimacy and relationship with us? Are we in pursuit of intimacy with, with our wives? Constantly? Are we called the pearl of great price? Is your wife the pearl of great price to you? Would you sell all to be with her? These, it was profound. It was profound and hard and, and wonderful because I don't ever want to forget these things. I want to be constantly reminded of how Christ loves the church so that I could do that. He created us to be pursued by him forever. He finds pleasure in his people. He sings over us. We are his delight, is your wife. He's concerned for me. He knows me intimately and is acquainted with all my ways.
Are you persistent and willing to sacrifice extravagantly for your relationship? I was totally blown out of the day one. I don't, I don't know if I can get through the rest of the book. Lord, I pray to soften our hearts as we yield your, to your will, that we may begin to grasp the measure, the depth, the intensity of the love that you gave all for us. Although we may never fully understand your love in, in full, let this facet of your divine nature shine on us as to transform us into your likeness so that we could be a reflection of you, Father. That our relationships would be solid, that would be blessed. Amen. Those of you who are single, I, I like to I shared my I shared my dating advice on, on Facebook once and my dad stole it. Run to God with all of your strength. Pursue Him. And if somebody can keep up with you, introduce yourself. Amen? Because if you're chasing after anything else, I got to have a man, I got to have a woman, I got to have a, a, a father for my son, I got to have, you know, you're not, you're not going the right direction. You end up in circles. I, I would hope that not just in the marriage relationships, but the, those that are even those even dating relationships, if you feel that you cannot, you won't be able to do and be this for that other person. You might you might want to get right with God first. You're not ready. Because it takes, it literally takes all to make a relationship. When you come out from underneath your mother and father and, and become one with your wife, you give it all up. You give all the selfish garbage up. It's better to clean up your, your, uh, your baggage before you get married. Go through the 60-day challenge. I'm not trying to plug product, but yeah, go through the 60-day challenge because you get, you get cleaned up. You, get, you deal with your, your suitcase full of stuff that you're bringing into marriage, uh, and you're in good shape when, you're, when you get married. And you continue it together afterwards, and, and, and it builds that intimacy. You know, see, what, what, what's really awesome about this whole scenario, God pursuing us, it was for intimacy. It was for, la- for relationship. When we're single, what are we pursuing? If you're not pursuing God, you could be pursuing sex, a rush of some sort, that feeling, you know. What was God searching? God pursues us for intimacy, for relationship. We should do likewise. I I screwed it up my whole life going after the wrong things. Because I think it felt good, or because of whatever. I, I don't even care about the reasoning anymore. It's, it's, it was from a different mindset. <laughs> but I think it's such a beautiful thing that God, at the core of his scripture, is all about relationship, and he starts it. He started it, and he paid for it. And he continuously goes after us, no matter what. That's incredible. Every time that we pick ourselves up, we get in our right mind, we come to our senses, we get out of the pig pen. He's there to meet us wherever we're at. And I think that what, what's, you know, sometimes the enemy says that you're stuck, you're no good, you're blah, 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 blah. And we believe it, hook, line, and sinker. And then we, we don't think about how God sees us still. God does not see us that way at all. God died for us when they were sin everywhere. He died for us. He goes after the sinner, the one that's lost. He goes after them. You know? 
And I just wanted to encourage you with some of the stuff that the Lord was speaking to me this week. I don't know how rudimentary it is to you guys, but I think that knowing that God pursues us, that He desires relationship above every, anything, communion with us, that we should reciprocate. I think that we, I, we should reciprocate. I don't even know how to reciprocate. It, it, even in, in Psalm 139, where, where, where the psalmist was like, these thoughts and these, this, this, whole, this whole idea of him loving me and knowing me and, and cherishing me and his thoughts are continually tormenting. It's so far beyond what I could comprehend. It is. It's too hard for us to comprehend. But we can accept it and, and, and live like we are loved. When we live like we are loved and we experience that love, it changes our entire outlook. It changes our, our families. It changes our, our, our ministry. Because we are accepted. We're loved. It's an, it's an incredible revelation. And I, and I praise God for it. And I'm glad that I was able to share it today with you guys. Amen. Amen. The worship team, come back up here. I want to close with that first song we did. Because we're still inviting the glory. It's the glory of God that's changing my son's life. It's the glory of God. All have sinned and what? Fall short of the glory. The pursuit of the glory needs to be where you are. You've got, you've been born again. Now we need to go from glory to glory. And we need to open our hearts <laughs> wide to it. <laughs> do I have singers or am I going to just do this song? Would you like me to break out in song? If Jennifer and I sing, it will remove the anointing out of the room. It'll be like a black hole. Stina. Okay. Thank you, Lord. How many, how many feel in their spirit, just as a believer, an anticipation of things to come? Okay. All right. It's there. We need to be God welcoming that anticipation. And also, I want to pray a prayer in light of Jason's message. I want us to close our eyes and make this a, a corporate request. Father, I pray for each and every individual in this room and each that is watching by you stream and that, that full stature church that is so dearly beloved of us that are out of state and around the world that watch on a regular basis and have the, they feel they have our DNA. This prayer is for you. Father, I release a spirit of wisdom and revelation that you would show us how beautiful we were in your mind's eye before we were knit together in our mother's womb. I'm going to say that again. Oh, that I could see how beautiful I was in your mind's eye before I was even knit together in my mother's womb. Before you had a chance to do anything wrong, he saw you fused together in his son Jesus. He saw us fused together as a new creation. How beautiful that must have appeared. And say, God, that is my identity. That is where we're going for. So, Father, right now, I just release a spirit of wisdom and revelation to how deeply and passionately I was loved. How in, in eons and eons of years past, you saw me in your mind's eye. Before I was formed in my mother's womb, all the days of my life were written beforehand, and you saw me. Oh, that I would see myself the way you see me, not, not in any other capacity. Remove any of the uh, uh, tinted, perverted, twisted views that I have toward myself. I receive forgiveness for any distortion, and I am openly God-welcoming. God-welcoming, how beautiful. Give us a glimpse of that. Speak to us through your scriptures to show us how beautiful we were before we were formed in our mother's womb. You saw us. You saw us. I want a glimpse of how you saw us, how beautifully and wonderfully we were made. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark 
of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.